Hello! In case you missed the most recent MarTech conference in San Jose, I thought I would recreate the keynote for you here. My name is Scott Brinker. I am the program chair of the MarTech conference. I'm also the editor of the Chief MarTech dot com blog uh, and I'm VP platform ecosystem at HubSpot. So uh, yeah, aside from MarTech, what do I like? I like more MarTech, MarTech 24-7. So I definitely want to thank everyone who participated in MarTech, uh, all the attendees, the sponsors, uh, the incredible collection of speakers that we had, uh, the moderators who helped out, the producers, Third Door Media. Uh, it's really impossible to put on an event like this without incredible contributions from so many people. So aside from all my MarTech titles, another title I have is Dad. Uh, this is my 10-year-old daughter, Jordan. And one of the best things about being dad is I can make dad jokes like, why do marketers hate trampolines? Because of the high bounce rate. All right, I'd, I'd like to pretend that's the only groaner you're gonna hear, but there, there might be a few more down the way. Um, so my daughter Jordan is really into art, which is wonderful. So I end up spending a lot of my time at AC Moore, the arts and crafts store. For that matter, a fair amount of my disposable income too. And the other day as I was wandering through the aisles, I came across this sign for an aisle. Basic crafts, pony beads, craft lace, duct tape. This is like one of those SAT questions where you're like, okay, which one of these seems out of place? I mean, don't get me wrong, I like duct tape. I mean, most of my home repair projects involve duct tape, but I hadn't really thought about it as an artistic medium, but it turns out it is. I mean, duct tape comes in this incredible variety of colors and patterns all sorts of amazing things you can do. I mean, you can even get like chiefmartech.com color duct tape, which I did. Um, but it turns out that people can make these incredible creations out of duct tape. Flowers and little billows and necklaces. Uh, in fact, Duck Brand, uh, who makes a lot of this uh, colored duct tape, uh, they have a whole website dedicated to these different craft projects that you can make out of duct tape, like bow ties and prom corsages, which there was something here about ducks and proms that gave me some flashback to an 80s movie. I think this was John Hughes. I think Ducky goes to the prom. And so I'm as in my 80s flashback here, I suddenly start thinking of that song by Weird Al Yankovic, I Want a New Duck. I know for those of you who are wondering who Weird Al Yankovic is, um, he's the guest accordion player for Weezer. All right, sorry for this flashback. I, I clearly drank too much new Coke as a kid. So, all right, let's, let's come back um, to our aisle. And I, I'm looking at this sign, and it struck me that, hey, this is kind of an interesting metaphor, right? We can think of basic crafts as marketing. Pony beads, you know, all this collection of these little pony beads is kind of like content. Because with all that content we have, there has to be a pony in there somewhere. Uh, craft lace, which connects all this stuff, is the customer journey. And then duct tape. Well, I mean, how we hold all these pieces together is kind of like MarTech, right? In fact, I could rename the entire iPass cloud data integration, RPA, and tag management category to maybe just duct tape. Um, and when I say duct tape, right, I mean, it's like pulling together all these incredible different pieces uh, into what we think of as our marketing stacks. You know, and I don't mean duct tape like, you know, the, you know, the ugly utilitarian duct tape. Well, there's probably a little bit of that. You know, it's really this duct tape as a medium for creating amazing capabilities in the modern marketing department. So one of the things we did at the MarTech conference was host this year's Stacky Awards. As you probably know from the Stackies, um, uh, marketers send in a single slide that illustrates the way they conceptualize their uh, marketing stack. 
Uh, and the entries are just absolutely amazing, right? It's not just the little logos of which tools they're using. It's how do they put that all together in some sort of grand picture. Uh, very often one that uh, they use to represent their brand ideals. Uh, so Airstream, for instance, uh, one of our winners uh, from this year's Stackies, uh, they make those uh, really groovy campers. Uh, this was their stack and you see, you know, the different camping locations correspond to different aspects of their stack, planning park, creative K, engagement forest, dealers rock, measure meadow, different tools they use in there. The size of the trees corresponds to how much time their team spends interacting with each tool. Really cool stuff. Um, and if you, you want to get a copy of all these stackies, they're now up on SlideShare. Just Google MarTech stackies or go to chiefmartech.com. It's one of our recent articles going through them. Uh, Esri, uh, which makes uh, geographic uh, information mapping software, uh, one of the leaders in the world on this. Uh, this is their stack. You heard of like the water cycle. This is essentially the marketing initiative cycle and the different tools. I love for the label of each tool, they also gave the short, you know, two or three word description uh, of what it actually does. Adobe Target for content optimization, WordPress for blog hosting. So it's very easy to explain uh, to people primarily throughout your company, uh, what is your MarTech stack and how does it help? Uh, beautiful stack here from the folks at Juniper. Uh, they do uh, three different clouds, pre-sales marketing, post-sales marketing, uh, and the intersection of pre- and post-sales marketing across uh, tools for management, content and experience, relationships and social, data, sales, paychecks. Uh, <laughs> you could do like a master's thesis just on the paychecks uh, stacky here. Uh, they've organized uh, different tools in different categories by the different color blocks. Uh, you know, along one axis here, the, the application of tools is foundational, operational, for nurturing or lead gen. And one of my favorite things is they organize the stack into these different tracks from fully automated tools all the way down to fully manual tools. So you sort of see how much human interaction is engaged uh, with the different tools. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Now I know some people say uh, the stackies are a cheesy awards contest, but in this case, hey, this is a cheesy stacky. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, super excited uh, that uh, Sargento Foods uh, entered their stack. Uh, and again, one of the things I liked about this one was uh, the team engagement bar at the bottom. So you actually get to see how much time different teams spend in different stages of the MarTech stack. Um, but despite all these cool things that marketers and marketing technologists are creating to, with uh, our, our, our version of uh, marketing duct tape, um, it's, it's still challenging at times, right? We still have the duct tape blues. Uh, the folks over at Ascend2 did a study just last November where integrating disparate systems still the biggest obstacle that marketers uh, claim they face to marketing success. Um, and so it struck me that, you know, this really is the inflection point. The past 10 years, we could definitely say this has been the first golden age of MarTech, right? The explosion of all these marketing technology tools. But a lot of the challenges we faced in this first 10 years was the debates of dichotomies, right? We had sweet versus best of breed, right? You could either get all your tools from one vendor, which is great because they're supposed to all work together tightly, supposed to, um, but uh, you know, you're pretty much limited by you know, what's in that suite versus best of breed uh, where, hey, you can take your favorite tools from all across the landscape uh, but it's really up to you to how you duct tape them all together, uh, right? So that was the big debate for these first 10 years. And then we had software versus services, right? You had software companies you bought tools from, you had agencies and other service providers, and never the two should meet. Um, and then we had the, even the debate of build versus buy, right? Do I buy off the shelf commercial tools and kind of have to take them as is? Uh, or do I build my own, which can be very custom to what I need, but uh, yeah, I may find myself reinventing the wheel. And so for all the good stuff of the first golden age of MarTech, 
these were really challenging dichotomies. And I would argue as we shift into the next 10 years, what stands to be the second golden age of MarTech, what's really exciting is this moving away from dichotomies and finding ways to pull these concepts together, a convergence. So instead of sweet versus best of breed, it's really now about platform ecosystems, right? These foundational systems that act as a hub at the center of your MarTech stack. Uh, but then there are all these third-party solutions that are designed to integrate with these platforms. And so they plug in uh, really smoothly together. So instead of duct tape, it's a little bit more like Legos. Uh, with software and services, right? It's, it's no longer a strict uh, division between those two. We see software companies now that are increasingly offering services to help marketers take advantage of what their tools are capable of doing. We also see service providers increasingly bottling some of their secret sauce into software and SaaS that they not only sell to their clients, but sometimes they sell to folks who aren't yet their services clients. And instead of build versus buy, again, going back to these platform ecosystems, we're increasingly seeing these foundational systems that are open and that have APIs so that you can buy the foundational capabilities off the shelf, don't have to recreate the wheel, but uh, you're then able to customize and tailor your own custom applications on top of that foundation. And so I talked about this earlier this year. There's a blog post up on Chief Martech about ecosystems, experts, and engineers. Uh, and this is what really has me excited. So as we go into this second golden age, there's still, of course, the uh, perennial question of is marketing technology, is the industry expanding, is it consolidating? Um, and that's always my answer tends to be, well, it's a little bit of both. Right? We continue to see this consolidation of competitors within particular categories. But even as that consolidation happens, there is still so much expansion of software uh, in the world, in business, in our lives, that in general, we still have more software this year than we did the previous year. And I think that trend is likely to continue. But what does that mean for the MarTech landscape? So one of the things we do here at the Spring MarTech event is release the updated marketing technology landscape. Uh, and this is the project that over the years has just uh, <laughs> taken on a life of its own, you know, from what used to be mapping a few hundred vendors in this space to uh, uh, thousands. I mean, last year we had uh, nearly 7,000 vendors. And so what was that landscape going to look like this year? You know, there's certainly reason to believe that it would consolidate, uh, right? We heard some very big deals here over the past 12 months in the MarTech space, right? Uh, Adobe acquiring Marketo, SAP acquiring Qualtrics, McDonald's acquiring Dynamic Yield. Huh, this feels like another one of these SAT uh, <laughs> questions. Um, so, 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 so a lot of interesting M&A activity in the space. But going to uh, the creation of this MarTech landscape, I have to say, you know, every year this becomes a bit of a crazy project because we generally don't start it until the beginning of a given year. So we can, you know, take the snapshot of the vendors who are actually here in 2019. Um, but yeah, I mean, with thousands of vendors, you know, like tracking them down, verifying which ones are still in existence, you know, trying to identify which new ones have entered the field, get all their logos, map them out. I mean, this is this is a very stressful process. I find like every year around New Year's, I start to, I start sweating. And, uh, you know, the stress was getting to me. So I, I even went and saw my doctor and my uh, doctor was advising, you know, Scott, maybe you should take up a hobby other than MarTech. Uh, I was like, you know, well, maybe that's a good idea, get my mind off of it. Uh, so I decided to take up watercoloring, uh, which didn't quite work out as far as taking my mind off of it. But uh, hey, some people would claim this is, you know, a kind of modern art, well, like Rothko. All right, actually, uh, the real stress reliever uh, in working on the landscape over these past few years uh, has been the incredibly generous contributions uh, of people in the community. Uh, so Anand Talker uh, helped with the 2017 and 2018 landscapes, uh, particularly uh, helped with organizing the way we manage data for uh, the year-to-year -year collection and analysis. 
Uh, the team at Blue Green, and we'll talk a little bit more about Blue Green further on in this presentation, they did the graphic design for the 2018 landscape, and here for the 2019 landscape, uh, they actually took on uh, all of the data research uh, as well. Uh, they had nine people <laughs> working on this here for like months uh, with me. So uh, yeah, you get a sense of the scope. Um, and so actually at MarTech, uh, I was delighted to have Jeff Ekman, the CEO of Blue Green, join me on stage to talk through this next section. But uh, uh, we will have the spirit of Jeff Ekman with us. So one of the things that Blue Green uh, did that I thought was kind of cool, they actually illustrated their own stack of tools that they used for creating the landscape. I mean, there's a lot of MarTech that goes into creating the MarTech landscape, which is kind of a meta thing here. Uh, you know, right? The different sites we used for data collection on finding vendors, uh, validation using Twitter and LinkedIn, and checking all of these websites. Uh, Blue Green had moved uh, the actual graphic design of the landscape from, well, I started in PowerPoint years ago, if you can believe that. Uh, they moved it to uh, the Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration over Slack and Zoom. They used Airtable for, you know, project management, um, uh, Dropbox for how we managed all the different logos. They created some of their own software that was running off of AWS, you know, with GitHub. Uh, and of course, uh, things like Dunkin' Donuts and uh, uh, for those of you in the Boston area, uh, Pizzeria Regina, you'll appreciate that. Uh, if you haven't heard of Pizzeria Regina, um, come to the Boston MarTech uh, this fall and uh, we'll make sure you get yourself a slice. And I mean, so even once they collected all of the data here, the process of just doing the graphic layout uh, of this year's landscape, again, with thousands of vendors, you know, gets into like all this algebra equations of like, okay, what should be the relative size of each category? Uh, and, uh, you know, then once you've got the, the map done, you know, there still is this uh, incredibly manual process to get the aesthetic we use for this landscape of these tightly packed uh, logos. So it pretty much has to be done by hand, of course, with Pizza or your Regina, essential ingredient. Uh, and the team at Blue Green, they, uh, they really got into this. They, um, they even held a little bit of an internal contest. They had this leaderboard of what the average logos per minute were for each of their different uh, team members. So like you can see MD was in the lead here with 2.771 logos per minute. Uh, way to go, MD. You know, one of the things I always loved about working on the MarTech landscape was the things you would discover along the way. There was always like some sort of cool tool you would find. In fact, this was literally a cool tool, your automated neuromarketing platform. Um, I love the names that people come up with to, uh, you know, try and distinguish uh, their MarTech uh, product uh, in this very crowded space, you know, like so in the dashboard space, like what a graph. I mean, I love it. It just has this enthusiasm. I kind of picture like Billy Crystal being like, what a graph, ladies and gentlemen, what a graph. Um, you know, for one with a little bit more attitude in that category, there's dash this. I mean, it sounds very, uh, I don't know, picturing this like, you know, sort of Brooklyn baseball game, like dash this, you know, which uh, is probably not what you want to say to your boss when, you know, he or she is asking you for this quarter's numbers. Um, face dominator. I think this was the one that Blue Green was like, really? Face Dominator, the Facebook marketing bomb. A little bit of a bizarre branding. Um, I mean, even just the use of like bomb and like the title is kind of bizarre. I mean, it's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, there's actually a product, Bomb Bomb. Rehumanize your communication with Bomb Bomb. I think, uh, yeah, they actually looked up and it turns out these folks are located in a cabin in Montana or something. Um, all right, all right. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I, I kid my good friends at Bomb Bob. They're actually a phenomenal tool uh, that's used for uh, video marketing uh, embedded in email. In fact, actually one of the stackies uh, that we were celebrating the night before uh, the MarTech keynote, uh, the AdWorks uh, stacky featured uh, Bomb Bomb as one of their favorite tools. Pretty cool. So one other thing that Jeff and the Blue Green team did that I thought was kind of cool is they thought, all right, we got all these logos of all these MarTech companies. 
what would happen if we got rid of the background of the Chief Martech colors, and we took all these other logos, we sort of blurred them all together, uh, then like amped up, uh, you know, the color saturation and tried to like boil it all down to one color. What would that color be? And it turned out this was the color of Martech. Uh, kind of a hazy blue. Uh, you know, it's like Martech blue. I have to say, when Jeff and his team uh, mentioned they were going to put this together, I was a little bit worried about what was going to come out on the other side. I was afraid that, you know, Martech Brown might not be as flattering to our industry, but uh, uh, luckily not. Martech Blue. All right, so this was the point in time uh, where we had the drum roll for unveiling the 2019 Martech landscape. Um, and uh, you've probably already seen this. And, you know, one of the questions we asked at the uh, uh, conference was, okay, well, are, were you anticipating this to grow or shrink? You know, most people thought it would grow, few people thought it would shrink. And then when we unveiled this, we we're like, okay, so, well, did it grow or did it shrink? Because it's actually kind of hard to tell, right? I mean, this is the 2018 landscape uh, from last year. And then just watch very closely. This is the 2019 landscape. It's kind of hard to tell. Did it grow or did it shrink? Um, and uh, just to verify, this is the 2019 landscape. There is a difference here. It turned out that, well, it kind of stayed about the same. I mean, it did grow a little bit, about 3% to a grand total of 7,040 solutions uh, on the 2019 landscape. Um, you know, there was a little bit of churn from the previous years of companies that went away, 4.7% from uh, uh, 2018, which is about what it had been from uh, the year before as well, too. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you put these all together and it would be kind of the conclusion that this might be peak MarTech, right? I mean, after years of double digit, or in the early years, even triple digit growth, this is the first year that we had single digit growth. So is this peak MarTech? I have to admit, I wasn't entirely sure whether or not I would be around to see the day of peak MarTech. But the other question is, is this just peak MarTech landscape? Because, as it turns out, there's a whole bunch of things that didn't make it onto the MarTech landscape that you are, could argue probably should have. As Shakespeare famously said, there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your landscape. And so I'd like to take you through a journey of some of the categories of things that didn't fully make it onto the MarTech landscape. And we'll start with regional MarTech, uh, MarTech from different countries around the world. I mean, this has been one of the things that's fascinated me for years is uh, uh, folks who have put together versions of the MarTech landscape uh, just featuring companies that are based in their particular country. That started with uh, Ryder put together the Canadian uh, MarTech landscape. This then inspired a team in Finland to put together the Finnish MarTech landscape, over a hundred companies on that. Uh, they also put together the German MarTech landscape last year. Uh, uh, my good friend Carlos with the MarTech Alliance in, uh, uh, out, out of London uh, put together the UK marketing technology landscape uh, last fall, over 400 uh, companies based out of the UK. There's several versions of the Chinese MarTech landscape. Uh, just uh, the other week, uh, the folks at Avaus uh, launched the Swedish uh, MarTech landscape. I mean, there is a lot of MarTech from all these different regions. And one of the things that's kind of, you know, well, I'm a little bit embarrassed by is as impressed as I've been with all these different landscapes uh, from different countries, it actually never occurred to us until we were pretty much done with this year's MarTech landscape, the global MarTech landscape, to say, hey, should we cross-reference uh, all the different logos from uh, you know all these other uh, landscapes? And uh, yeah, we just hadn't done that, and so we started looking like you know a few days before the MarTech conference, and like, oh my goodness, there's dozens, actually, there's hundreds of regional MarTech companies that we failed to include on the landscape. 
All right, so another category uh, that's growing that isn't well represented on the MarTech landscape is vertical MarTech. MarTech that's built for companies in a very specific industry. Uh, you know, so again, these are largely companies that are not on the MarTech landscape that, that we just released, like Labworthy, uh, that makes a tool for uh, helping labs market and sell to dentists. I love the little pun here of uh, measure customer loyalty and retain your dentist. Retain, all right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, church CRM. It's actually, it's fascinating. There's several uh, CRMs available for um, uh, churches. Uh, there was uh, Easy Church CRM, which is on the landscape. But then, uh, yeah, we were hunting around a bit, uh, you know, right before the conference and we found churchcrm.io, which is this company, and uh, yeah, we, we completely miss them on the landscape. MindBody uh, is a tool for uh, helping gyms and spas manage their relationships with their customers, also do marketing to them. Now, we do have MindBody on the landscape, but what's interesting is MindBody has a whole marketplace of all these other third-party solutions that plug in and enhance and augment MindBody. And most of these tools did not make it onto the MarTech landscape. Which actually brings us to this third category of ecosystem-specific MarTech. Now, this brings us back to, uh, you know, this transition from the first golden age to the second golden age, this emergence of platform ecosystems. As major platforms open up more APIs and as they have more well-defined programs for attracting and certifying and promoting uh, the uh, third-party solutions that build on top of their platform, you know, we're seeing these explosion uh, of apps built for specific MarTech platforms. What's interesting is, yeah, I mean, going through these uh, these marketplaces that have now sprung up across all these, uh, you know, marketing platforms. Uh, yeah, most of the solutions in those marketplaces we haven't captured on the MarTech landscape. Uh, so I'll go through a few here, like uh, starting with Salesforce App Exchange. And what I've done is I've sort of grayed out uh, the tools that are on the MarTech landscape, uh, but all the ones I've left here, Optilize, Give Lively, Media, Velox, Rocket Notes, uh, these are ones that aren't on the MarTech landscape. But they're certainly valid MarTech. Uh, Oracle's Marketing Cloud, I was going through that, and this is just one page where I found, okay, well, four of these tools we have on the MarTech landscape, but four of them, like uh, Motiva AI and EA Link, we didn't. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Even uh, HubSpot's uh, own uh, directory of software solutions on our platform. We got a bunch of them on the MarTech landscape this year, but as I went through afterwards, I'm like, oh, wow, we missed several, like, uh, you know, Better Proposals and Story Chief. Uh, and my apologies to them. I, I'll probably hear from them shortly. Yeah, we'll, we'll do better. Um, uh, G Suite, right? They have a whole category of tools in their marketplace for marketing and analytics. Most of them did not make it onto the market. MarTech landscape. Uh, Shopify went to their app store and literally the first four things that were featured at the top uh, of the Shopify app store were tools that are not on the MarTech landscape. Uh, and then we even went to the big granddaddy of platforms from the MarTech world, WordPress. And it turns out, right, I mean, for their plugins directory, there's 54,880 plugins. Now, I don't know exactly how many of these didn't make it onto the MarTech landscape, but just doing the math, it's got to be at least, you know, 47,840, um, you know. Now, <laughs> This is where I turn to Jeff. I'm like, so are you and uh, the team ready next year for the MarTech 50,000? Uh, and which point he started to uh, wave and walk off the stage. Uh, but I brought him back here because, uh, you know, this fourth category is actually one that Blue Green uh, is just an incredible example of, which is services MarTech, marketing technology that's being built and offered by companies that predominantly had been services companies. But moving into the second golden age of MarTech are really bringing blended models of software and services. And so there's a bunch of tools out there, like Deloitte has their Clearlight Analytics platform. Didn't make it on the MarTech landscape. Accenture has their MyWizard automation platform that 
did not make it onto the MarTech landscape. PwC has their digital fitness app uh, that they set up for clients uh, that sadly did not make it onto the MarTech landscape either. Um, and it's not just the major uh, consulting houses. Uh, you know, I, a few weeks ago, I met a company, CRMT, uh, based out of the UK. Uh, they help companies set up uh, marketing operations and uh, MarTech stacks. Uh, and one of the things they found is there were different, you know, the, the integration of these different tools, one of the challenges many of their clients has was normalizing the data across them, making sure that the same field lined up to the right things and the other products uh, and manage the data quality there. So they actually build a product, Normalator, to help with that normalization. And they offer it as a SaaS product, not just to their clients, but to others. And then Blue Green is actually a phenomenal example. So Blue Green started as a company for a very high level kind of conversion optimization. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the name Blue Green came from, right? You know, greenfield opportunities, blue sky ideas. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of the work they did was what they've called conversational UX, which is not just running A-B tests on individual pages, but understanding A-B testing in the context of how users go through different flows uh, in signing up or purchasing uh, you know, products uh, on websites. Uh, and they've worked with just some uh, super amazing clients over the years. But one of the things they found is there wasn't really a tool that analyzed, that combined this sort of flow with visualizing the pages, with giving you the analytics off of A-B tests. And so they actually built their own blue-green analytics. Um, and uh, they initially deployed this for you know use with their clients for things like uh, A to B path mapping and real-time data visualization, uh, super seamless integration. This plugs into existing things like tag managers and CMS tools that you have. So it's actually, it's a good example in some ways of like an ecosystem solution. It plugs into these open platforms. Um, and uh, yeah, they found this tool, which they offer as a SaaS. This isn't just helpful for their clients, although they certainly use it with them, but this is a SaaS tool that they're now able to make available for any company that would like this sort of capability. And so it's this, a, a terrific example of this sort of blending of services companies now offering software products too. Now, Blue Green did make it onto the MarTech landscape, but that's because, hey, I mean, they were building the MarTech landscape. Uh, so they had a little edge there. But most of these services solutions, we just haven't even been able to discover them all uh, in a systematic way to uh, get them all on the MarTech landscape. All right, the last category of things that really didn't make it onto the MarTech landscape, but I think are fascinating, is what I call citizen MarTech. And this goes down to this, uh, you know, uh, notion of engineers or citizen engineers. And as we transition from the first golden age of MarTech to the second, we're moving from a world where, again, it's, you know, this dichotomy of build versus buy to starting with a foundational platform, an open platform, and then building little custom apps on top of that. Now, part of that is letting, you know, professional developers uh, use, you know, professional programming languages to build apps. But increasingly, it's also about using low code and no code solutions that let regular business users also customize these platforms and build their own little apps. I mean, it's just one example, you know, of a company that provides this capability uh, is Airtable. Uh, you know, an Airtable, if you can use a spreadsheet, you can use Airtable and you can use it to build these kind of groovy uh, collaborative web apps. Now you might say, okay, well, I mean, that's cool, but uh, right, you know, you now have arguably, because anyone who can use a spreadsheet can use Airtable to build apps, you've got like an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, more people who could be creating these MarTech apps. But you might say like, all right, well, you know, those are little custom apps for an individual company. They're not really things that get created for the rest of the people in marketing, you know, outside of your company to use. So they don't, they shouldn't really count, you know, for the MarTech landscape. 
But what's interesting is, yeah, just the screen you see uh, now here, Airtable has created this kind of little directory marketplace where people can list the apps that they've built in Airtable and make them available to others, uh, you know, to download and run, uh, you know, with their version of Airtable. Um, and so, yeah, they've built like all these incredible marketing and sales applications that, yeah, now anyone can pull out of Airtable universe. So in a very real sense, these are becoming a collection of MarTech apps, uh, you know, that are available to anyone. Uh, with Airtable. And it's not just Airtable. I mean, there's a whole site, uh, Zero Code, uh, uh, you know, for no-code solutions. It has a bunch of great templates and tools you can use. Um, you know, the folks at OutSystems, uh, one of the leading low-code platforms out there, uh, they've created a whole marketplace where, again, people can download, uh, you know, plug-and-play uh, applications. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you take these things collectively, and these really do become a another set of apps that are available to any marketing operations, marketing technology leader who's assembling their own stack. Um, so you pull all this together, right? I mean, the MarTech landscape is huge, but all these things I just showed you are largely things that are not on the MarTech landscape. Regional MarTech, vertical MarTech, ecosystem MarTech, services MarTech, and citizen MarTech. Uh, but in a real sense, they, they probably should be. Now, I'm not saying that all of these tools are equal. Uh, you know, certainly the MarTech field is an incredible long tail, you know, where, you know, we've got tens of platforms in the head, you know, things like, uh, you know, Adobe and Salesforce and Oracle and HubSpot. I mean, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of users, you know, uh, these, these, these are those, you know, centralized platforms. You know, and then we've certainly got hundreds of category leaders that are in the torso, you know, very specialized solutions for things like, you know, event marketing or influencer marketing. And then you start to go down to thousands of more specialized apps and components in the long tail. But then even things that, yeah, didn't make it onto the MarTech landscape, but we've started to go through some of these other examples of, you know, you see there's also tens of thousands of ecosystem-specific and citizen MarTech apps. We can call that in the long, long tail too. You know, and so, yeah, sure, something like, uh, you know, Adobe uh, is at a very different level than, say, a WordPress uh, plugin like Social Warfare. But, you know, I actually just installed Social Warfare on the Chief MarTech blog, and it is an awesome product. Uh, incredibly helpful, was happy to pay for it. I know thousands of other people subscribe to it, too. And so even though it's probably not going to be like this multi-billion dollar public company like Adobe, is still very much a valid part of the MarTech uh, technology ecosystem. So yeah, is MarTech consolidating or expanding? Well, again, within individual categories, we certainly see competition bringing consolidation. But when you look at the total amount of software that's available to marketers and uh, businesses as a whole, it continues to expand. So uh, one last thing uh, on the MarTech landscape uh, is, again, uh, with the help of Jeff and the Blue Green team, we put together an Excel uh, sheet of all the MarTech uh, solutions that were on this year's landscape. And you can download that off of the chiefmartech.com uh, site, the, one of the most recent posts on the landscape. You'll see the call to action for that. So again, I say thank you uh, to Blue Green for their help in 2018 and 2019 landscapes. Literally could not have done it without you. So for this last little section of the keynote, uh, I want to shift gears because we talked a lot about the tools in MarTech, uh, you know, with stacks and the landscape, uh, but it really is the craftsperson, not the tool. And so I wanted to share some of the data that we had collected earlier this year from our salary survey. Uh, so to speak, I could show you the money, but uh, it's actually the money is the least interesting part of this to me. I want to first share with you some of the other characteristics of marketing operations and technology professionals uh, that we found uh, coming out of this year's survey, comparing it with the one we had last year. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is increasingly the number of people who identify with being in marketing operations 
or combined marketing operations and technology uh, definitely seems to be growing larger compared to those who identify as purely marketing technology. Uh, so you could say that, yeah, marketing operations is like absorbing uh, marketing technology management is part of it. Um, okay, this isn't a particularly flattering image, but uh, it's a little bit more like this. I mean, marketing operations, you know, has really come into its own over the past few years. And you could argue that it's marketing technology that has really elevated the marketing operations function, you know, from what used to be a very, uh, you know, reporting, uh, you know, process oriented group, still plenty of that, you know, but now it's really about the capabilities they provide to the marketing team through all the marketing technology uh, that they uh, design and implement and operate. You know, still different titles for these things out here. Just at uh, Adobe Summit a few weeks back uh, at MetLife, there was an interview with a new marketing CIO. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a groovy title, too. Um, but for most folks, you know, running in marketing technology and marketing operations, where do they report? Uh, turns out that, <laughs> well, they report to marketing, uh, you know, a little bit to IT and, you know, certainly some uh, in, in digital groups or, uh, you know, outside uh, uh, service providers. Uh, but yeah, most people in marketing operations and marketing technology report to marketing, which again, always kind of seemed to me like, you know, the question of who's buried in Grant's tomb? Well, uh, Grant, all right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's great to see, you know, marketing operations and marketing technology as a really uh, a foundational element uh, of the marketing organization as a whole. And increasingly, it's an experienced part of the marketing profession. Uh, this year's survey found that uh, nearly half of our participants have eight years or more of experience uh, in marketing technology and operations roles. Um, another, you know, if we expand it to, you know, six or more years, it was uh, you know, nearly two thirds. Uh, so, I mean, this is starting to become a profession that has some history, some experience to it. Um, it's also one where people tend to move forward in their careers relatively quickly. I was very happy to see that again this year, um, uh, the rate of promotion within marketing operations and technology tends to be pretty high. 77.7% uh, of our respondents had been promoted within the past two years. Uh, I thought of this like mnemonic of, you know, 777, the jackpot win. Uh, this is clearly a great career to be working in. Um, and so what sort of educational background do marketing technology and operations people tend to have? Again, another interesting data point here where it turns out only about 5-6% have an undergraduate degree in computer science or IT. Uh, another 6.6% uh, have a degree in some other kind of engineering or science, but most, 32.1%, have a business or economics degree, and 293 have a liberal arts degree. Um, you know, when I was uh, going to college uh, sometime long ago, uh, you know, there, there there was this joke that was going around where uh, when you're trying to decide your major, uh, they would say, oh, well, uh, you know, if you an engineering major asks the question, how does it work? And a science major is going to ask the question, why does it work? And a liberal arts major is going to ask, do you want fries with that? But uh Actually, based on this most recent MarTech uh, salary survey uh, and some of the things we see in the industry, really the question is, hey, if you've got a liberal arts degree, it's, you, the question you're asking is, hey, do you want MarTech with that? Um, and, uh, you know, all joking aside, it's actually, you know, the liberal arts is an incredible worldview to bring to marketing technology and operations. Because one of the big challenges we are still wrestling with is how do we balance the automation that all this technology enables with the humanization, the human element in how we engage with prospects and customers and how we engage you know, our own uh, staff uh, throughout the company. So actually, I, I think a liberal arts degree uh, is a beautiful match uh, with marketing technology. Now, one of the things I covered in a, uh, a blog post earlier this year on Chief Martech was, again, based on the salary survey, we broke down the 
different responsibilities that marketing tech and ops uh, uh, professionals have. Uh, there were this cluster of five that we saw across almost everyone uh, researching and recommending new MarTech, actually operating marketing technology stacks, training and supporting marketing staff on how to use all this MarTech and get the most value out of it, integrating different marketing technology products and monitoring data quality. And there's a framework that I've been uh, promoting here for a while. Uh, if uh, you want, you can go back to the, uh, uh, the new rules of marketing technology and operations from last year. But it was putting marketing ops and technology on this grid of how you balance automation versus humanization, centralization versus decentralization, and then at the center of that, manage continuous change. And what's interesting to me is you can take those five primary responsibilities uh, of MarTech roles, and they essentially map to these five elements, all right? Researching and recommending new marketing technology is very much about keeping up with continuous change. Operating marketing technology is very much a centralization, uh, you know, common technology services uh, offering. Training and supporting marketing staff on marketing technology tends to be a centralized solution we use for helping people uh, throughout the marketing organization take advantage uh, of marketing technology. Integrating marketing technology products uh, is uh, uh, working with all these automated technologies, but in a little bit more of a decentralized way. How do we let people use, uh, bring in more specific tools for their particular needs and integrate them easily with the rest of our marketing stack? Uh, and then I put monitor data quality down in the humanize and decentralized quadrant because Again, it kind of takes a village for uh, empowering people, not just in the marketing department, but throughout the company, uh, you know, to act as our eyes and ears for when does the data, you know, of our model of prospects and customers, when does it start to diverge from what we're actually hearing, you know, uh, in the human interactions with people and make sure that we keep those in sync. The uh, the disappointing thing that I emphasized out of uh, you know this year's studies, we still find this gap where most marketing ops and tech folks are not focused on data privacy and security reviews. You know, in all fairness, it could be that they're uh, you know turning to uh, specialized experts on those topics uh, you know elsewhere in the organization, but. This really feels to me like a joint responsibility. And certainly, you know, I mean, a slightly better good news that as you go up into director or VP level marketing tech and ops people, you know, they have a little bit more responsibility for this, but still not as much as it needs to be. And I feel like, you know, given the things we see in the world today, right? You know, this is <laughs> the, the, the sign we should be uh, paying more attention, uh, you know, as marketing ops leaders to security and data privacy. Um, so we do have all the you know, salary data and you can get this uh, off of a free report that's you know, now available off of uh, chiefmartech.com. Um, I won't dig into you know, all the numbers here. The, the short version is basically uh, MarTech and marketing operations is a very uh, well-paying uh, career. And as we saw earlier, one with a lot of promotion and a lot of, uh, yeah, just really exciting opportunity. So this is the uh, summary, uh, the recreation uh, of the MarTech keynote. I'm sorry uh, you weren't able to make it live to the show, but again, we will have our next event coming up in the middle of September in Boston. A whole new program, all new speakers. Uh, going to be a really fantastic experience. So go to martechconf.com uh, and see about getting your ticket now. Thanks. Have a great day.